starting our webinar shortly. Welcome. Uh, we'll start at five o'clock. And we'll get started at five o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Central, three o'clock Mountain, two o'clock Pacific. <laughs> uh, here in uh, uh, the webinar land, we're waiting for uh, five o'clock Eastern time where we'll get started. Um, welcome, get yourself situated. We're going to have a good time. <laughs> So there's 22. So right now there's 22 logged in. All right. Oh, there's your flyover, Cynthia. All right. Yes. <laughs> there you're flying. Oh. Because uh, I'm missing Jane here. And we're just waiting for the countdown to Engineers Week and Grow Day webinar. <coughs> um, we're gonna give it just a few more minutes for people to join us. Now we start right on time. Uh, so I can see everyone's rolling in now. Turn off my phone. That would be the polite thing to do. I just don't care. Just another minute uh, as people join us, and then we'll get started with today. Oh, gee, thanks, Tina. We have to sit together. Let's get going. Jake, would you hit record, please? Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Thea Sar. I'm the Director of Communications and Programs for Discover E. Welcome to this year's Countdown to Engineers Week and Girl Day webinar. Um, we are very excited that you could all join us, and we're just kind of astounded that it's only five weeks till Engineers Week. Um, Joining me today is Cynthia Chin. She is a math teacher uh, in, uh, and the Engineering Club Nesby and Ship Junior co-advisor. Also joining me is uh, Tina, head of youth services at Montrose, Colorado uh, Regional Library. And uh, uh, her colleague, Jerry Gillum, uh, head of outreach services also for the Montrose. Hello. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. And my colleague, Jake uh, Williams, uh, in our DC office is joining today. He's going to be helping out, uh, answering all your questions and any technical issues. Uh, Jake will be uh, the man to see. All right. So, um, like I said, welcome, everyone. Uh, just, just two quick minutes. Who is Discover E? Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are the folks. We like to say we're the E in STEM. And uh, we do lots of things, but mostly what we try and do is support our community of volunteers and educators to give them the resources they need. Whoops, a daisy, my phone is ringing. Uh, <laughs> that for you? Uh, to give them the resources they need to go out there and educate, um, educate kids and uh, uh, engineers. So that'll only go on for four rings. And, <laughs> I'm sure it's someone telling me that my credit rating is fabulous. <laughs> All right. So we work with a community of 50,000 volunteers and educators reaching 6 million students every year. And we like to say it's your knowledge and their future. Your knowledge about making students and exciting them and getting them ready to explore different uh, opportunities. So uh, welcome to 2020. <laughs> Uh, who's messed up their checks so far this year? Does anyone write checks? <laughs> no. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but it's five weeks to Engineers Week. Uh, Engineers Week is February 16th to the 22nd. 
And uh, Introduce the Girl to Engineering Day is always the third week of uh, Engineers Week on February 20th. And we've got lots of great stuff planned for both Engineers Week and Girl Day. Um, uh, and I guess I'm just kind of curious about all of you out there and want to ask you, how prepared are you for Engineers Week and Girl Day? I'm going to start our poll. Um, and are you ready? Uh, are you almost ready, but you just have a few more things to do? Uh, you got some ideas, but you have some plans? I cannot vote. <laughs> I can't or, vote. Yeah, no, uh, Tina and Jill. I'm trying to vote. I don't get to vote. This is just <laughs> <laughs> paying attention. They've got no ideas. Help, I need help. <laughs> um, so uh, right now we have about 51% of the audience has voted. So we'll just give you all another moment to take a, take a uh, talk and tell us what you're doing. Um, you're almost ready, right? So, uh, 68%, 70%. I always like to get it really above the national voting average. <laughs> We've already surpassed that, so woohoo! <laughs> uh, all right, 70%. Uh, we're holding steady at 70%. Oh, down to 68%. Someone new must have come in. Uh, so we can have a moment and take the poll. All right, I'm going to end the poll and I hope I can share the results. Uh, can everyone see the results? Mm -hmm. All right. So, only one person is ready. <laughs> I can tell us that that person is who you are. Congratulations. Uh, almost just a few more things to take I care of. You. Uh, about a third of you are there. So a lot of you, the vast majority, you have some ideas but no firm plans. And there's a good selection of you who are in the help help category. Um, so this is great. I think that uh, what you're going to find with today's conversation, it's really going to be a very casual conversation. Um, if you've been to our webinars before, you've heard me drone on with lots of details and lots of resources. And today I really wanted to have us all have an opportunity to uh, talk to the folks who are doing the work. So we're going to have a really fun conversation with Tina and Jill and Cynthia and hear what they're doing, how they do it, uh, what they do, and then give you all a chance to ask some questions to them and share a little bit about what you're doing. And then of course, I'll give you at the end uh, a, a quick run through of the various resources we have. Um, so if you're in the help help stage, hopefully, or any stage, uh, by the end of our time together, you'll feel a little bit more confident and have some great ideas you can run with this engineers week and girl day. All right. So Cynthia, you're up first. All right. Tell us about your Engineers Week uh, and or Girl Day plans for this year. Okay. Well, this year is still in progress. So I, if you'd asked me the poll, I wouldn't be totally ready yet. But um, I do have some wonderful precedents of things we've been able to do at our school in the past. So I'll be speaking mostly about 2018, 2019. Those are our larger events. Um, we're a high school of approximately 1,800 students. And we're, we have eight elementary schools that feed into us, as well as three middle schools. So what we did in February of 2018, and again in February of 2019, is we hosted a family night out, but we called it a family engineering night out. Um, and that consisted of uh, families coming to our large high school and um, participating in about one hour of various activity stations that were run by college and high school students, also uh, by some community volunteers. Um, they were geared toward elementary and middle school students, so fairly simple activities, but um, as you know, uh, an engineer can make anything simple fairly complex rather quickly by thinking about it in a certain way. Um, we also showed a 90-minute film. Um, the first the first year we did it, it was the Dream Big film, which maybe it was a little bit less than 90 minutes, as I recall. But the last year we showed one called Underwater Dreams. It's an independent film, documentary film about a group of uh, students in Arizona who competed in a robotics competition. They actually became quite famous because they were high school students who beat 
um, several prestigious colleges uh, in that competition. And it's a fantastic film. I won't go into that now, but it, it's the title is Underwater Dreams and very much worth watching. Um, so we showed that and then to follow up with either film, we had a panel of university students do some small group uh, question and answer with either parents who had questions about career directions for their students or students middle school, high school age who felt comfortable asking about what do you love about engineering, why did you pick this major and so forth. So those are our activities. I will mention that um, the Underwater Dreams film specifically features Spanish speaking families, immigrant families. So we made a special effort to reach out to our Spanish speaking community for that uh, month. All right, cool. So you're a teacher, why are you hosting public events and how does this benefit your students? Well, I advise the school engineering club. Uh, just, it's a great way to show my students the applications of the mathematics in particular that they're learning in my classes. But our, our club has three major missions. We're trying to support hands-on engineering design and build opportunities for our students. We're trying to educate ourselves and the larger community about um, engineering careers and the paths that we can take to get to those. And we're trying to grow the STEM pipeline in our own community. Within our high school attendance area, we'd like our, our younger students to start thinking about STEM early, think about some of the exciting things they can do, and, and meet us and, and meet uh, their future home as high school students and even transitioning on into college. So uh, our parents and other community members it builds awareness for them as well and an understanding of what are the academic routes to these careers. And so we're hoping that when parents and community members see this, they see the opportunities, they can support their students to move ahead. Um, Wisconsin happens to be a place where um, students of color and women are underrepresented in many STEM fields. So for us to arrange uh, an event specifically for um, students and families of color and to have participants who are also persons of color talk about their experiences is very powerful and uh, we feel like it's the benefits are you know just trickle through the years that's our goal yeah oh that sounds fabulous nice <laughs> we have a question for Cynthia so far uh, Megan asks uh, she said you mentioned Dream Big. She's planning to show Dream Big, and she said she really likes the movie, but she was wondering if you did anything to set it up. Um, were, were the girls tuned in? Did you get comfortable seating? How did you, uh, how are you playing this, to, or how did you uh, last year um, kind of set up the, the Dream Big showing? Yep, so we, uh, we have, our school has an auditorium with a, a pretty nice size screen, and so we ob obtained a, a preview copy of the film and just showed it on a large screen. Um, if you haven't looked at them yet, the materials that there's an activity booklet that was produced to go along with the film. That's actually how we got the film as a preview copy was we agreed to use some of the activities and report back. The activities, some of them are complicated, but some of them are very simple. They can definitely be led by uh, high school students um, and they're they're pretty worthwhile. They're, they're arranged by grade level and complexity and there's background information available. Um, there's materials lists and so forth. I would strongly recommend that you actually test the activities before you uh, do them with, with a, your target audience, but um, they link in very well with the film and there's a lot of supplementary video and a lot of things you could do to uh, promote the event through the Dream Big website. And so uh, where you can find all those activities is at discover e slash dream big. Uh, and if you go to educators section, it talks about free, it talks about um, the activities. Also, if you're a, a volunteer, I don't know, Megan, if you're a volunteer or an educator, um, but the, the, the website is chocked full of resources, the resources that Cynthia was mentioning, the activities, tips, how to organize. We actually have an agenda on that page, how to organize an event, so check it out. All right. Um, 
Tina and Jerry, can you tell us about your Engineer Sweeping Girl Day plans? Um, well, we usually try to um, find a theme. Uh, this year's theme came about because of a small grant that I applied for. Um, it's called No Limits, and it was part of the National Girls Collaborative Project. Um, and it just, I must, I must have been signed up for something. I, um, I think it's who I used the year before. So I got an email about the grant and applied, and I actually got a small part of that. Um, and that gave me my theme because they are promoting, um, with Mercedes-Benz and Mattel, uh, little matchbox cars to promote um, the 1962 Argentinian race of Evie Rosquist, if I say her name correctly. She run, won that race by three hours and set a land speed record um, as the first woman to do that. So they're giving away uh, little matchbox cars to everyone. So I have 200 cars. So that led to the theme of um, automobiles, mechanical engineering. So then I started calling around our town and we have um, a classic car group here. So they're gonna bring some of their cars. And I got a name through them of a young girl who was about 19 or 20, who was an IndyCar driver in the town nearby. So I just uh, called her and she's going to be our guest speaker. So um, I have my guest speaker lined up and I've got some lovely cars that are gonna be sitting out for pictures and then we'll have some activities to go along with that. Um, some of them I probably got off discovery on the activities page. Um, so things, uh, all ages, we like to have things of different activity uh, levels and skills so we can have babies on up to adults that can do these projects. Right. Um, so we'll have little things like maybe painting a car uh, testing their little cars that they get on different strata um, for friction. Um, maybe we'll have some Lego building. I saw some activities for Lego and balloon races. So we'll have different kinds of activities to go along with that. And um, we have about a two hour window on um, February 20th that we'll have this program. Can you talk about the program? And then, if, and yeah, then. <laughs> if, if it translates well, if I still have cars left over, which I hope I do, we'll take it on to the bookmobile and that's right. where Jerry takes over. And we also thought about talking about bringing the actual bookmobile to the event and showing how that works. And we are drivers of it and we are women and we designed the we book designed van. a book van as well. So, you know, there's such things as pilots checklists, things that we can go over when we're explaining how a bookmobile works um, and to be a driver of a bookmobile is a pretty big deal. It's 32 feet long. Um, so Tina and I collaborate many of her projects and take it out on the road. And that's always got a whole set of challenges when you take it into a park or, you know, off site, which is very fun. We call it affordable and portable. Yeah, affordable so. and portable <laughs> and accessible. Yes. Yeah. Well, isn't that's the three, like, that's the holy, that's the, what we all shoot for in, in, yeah. in education, right? Accessible, affordable, portable. <laughs> yes. You those and you're like, woo, home run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, so how, do, how, does a, how does a library in, you know, in Montrose, Colorado, uh, you know, get involved in Engineers Week and why did you do it and what was the motivation and, you know, what mission and goals were you trying to achieve? Um, both Jerry and I moved into the Youth Services Department um, four and a half, almost five years ago. Um, we were on the bookmobile before that and in other places in the library. Mm -hmm. So we got to start building our programming at that point. Um, and I started a STEM program and I call it STREAM. We throw in reading and art in there. Um, when I first started in 2017, um, it was for eight to 13 year olds. Then the next year we threw on um, STREAM Junior for four to seven year olds. Um, so we, you know, obviously part of that is going to be all kinds of engineering and STEM activities. Uh, the very first one I did to, like I said, 2017, um, actually was Jerry's idea because it was all about airplanes. Right. So um, <clears throat> just basic paper airplanes. And then we gave them, uh, so paper airplanes, we showed them designs for different kinds, the 
to, to fold. Um, we gave them pennies to try and see how much their, their plane could carry. Could they get it through the hula hoop or the destination? And mm -hmm. then we gave them uh, instructions with propellers and different parts to try and then build a slightly bigger, better airplane. So it's something quite simple like that started it and then it builds over that. Then the next year I have the two age groups and that's when we did squishy circuits and the geodesic dome. Then um, n the next year, uh, the, let's see, last year was the first one that was really organized for Introduce a Girl to Engineering. And that was by happenstance watching in the newspaper, uh, our town, Montrose, Colorado, actually had the first all-female uh, med flight crew in Colorado. So I contacted them and said, hey, will you come and speak to the girls uh, or everyone that shows up? And we had over huge. 91 <laughs> show up. Yeah. Um, and that was the theme of last year. That was another flight. And we had helicopter yeah. um, activities and it was a great turnout. So yeah, the adults wanted it. <laughs> so yeah, it turned out really well. <laughs> really good. That was really nice of them to come and uh, volunteer that time mm -hmm. for us. So it just kind of builds and then we have little things that might be passive in the room if, like i said if we can take it on the bookmobile we will mm -hmm. so yeah wow cool that's I, I love that evolution that's quite a story so cynthia i know this is a question that we get all the time in these webinars so how much does an event cost and how do you support it you know is it is it all coming out of you know the, your teacher salary which <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the rolling in dough <laughs> yep. so you can see our our makeshift hovercraft there which is um particle board and uh, uh reconverted um leaf no blower or leaf blower leaf or something blower. like that right a shop back i think it is oh, okay. so, right awesome. so so we're definitely about um doing with what we have um typically where the money goes is um, we might have snacks or food. Um, there are some materials that we'll purchase, but we tend to do a lot of uh, reusable, recyclable things. We build lots of things with newspaper. We use um, toothpicks and marshmallows and spaghetti, um, kind of um, common household things, partly because it's cheap, and partly because we'd like to have an activity that, hey, a family could follow up and try this again with their student at home. Maybe say, hey, could you improve on what you did at the event? Maybe we can try this some more and just sort of perpetuate that, that type of engineering thinking away from the event. Um, for, for the film, as I mentioned, for Dream Big, we, we were able to show that as a, as a preview opportunity a sort of a pilot opportunity for underwater dreams we did have to purchase public showing rights we chose to do that rather than just um, go go around the um, around the law um, but so that was about five hundred dollars to purchase the sh public showing rights for that film um, but we can reuse it now so we felt like it was a worthwhile investment um, our money comes from classic uh, school fundraising small local grants, um, selling candy bars, selling gummy bears. Uh, we do a penny drive. Actually, in the month of February, we do an annual penny drive that's been very successful. We raise, uh, you know, one to two thousand dollars every year as a whole school penny drive with half of it going to Engineers Without Borders and the other half going to support uh, activities with the engineering club. So. Um, that's, that's most of it. And then some of the more sophisticated projects tend to be show and tell um, items that another group will bring in. So we're not buying the expensive drone or the expensive robot kits and so forth, but there might be an outside community group that's already made that investment for themselves, but they're willing to come and share um, what they have and to show um, our community what's out there. Love that. Yeah. Economical, reduced, re and environmental. Right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Tina, where do you get your ideas for your STEAM programming? Everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. All the time. <laughs> yes. Pinterest is always great. 
um, blogs, Pinterest. Um, best piece of uh, advice I ever got was at a conference and they said to read your local newspaper. So um, I've seen people in the paper starting up drone programs. Mm -hmm. um, our local high school has robotics. We've um, talked to both of them and used, uh, used the robotics at this point. I'm still wanting to do the drones, haven't got that far yet. Um, talking to the people I work with, the classic cars um, actually uh, is the husband of a librarian who used to work with us and is the school librarian, uh, one of the local elementary mm -hmm. librarians. So um, I, it could be something I wanted to do as a kid. I don't know. Um, <laughs> could be things I did uh, as homeschooling my son and I'm just doing it again and bigger and better. We just did mummies. Um, so, you know, it just, you never know what it is. It's just kind of reliving childhood for some things and it's seeing something brand new and trendy and techy, um, you know, Minecraft and engineering and architecture. Um, so I find it everywhere. I try to look for ideas in everything we do and everyone I talk to. She does. <laughs> and, and is it a year-round endeavor? Is this something you just start like a couple weeks before? I have, I will show you. She never stops. It's my notebook, my thick notebook of ideas. I write down ideas <laughs> constantly and there's several tabs for different yeah. kinds. So yeah, if I come across something, I write it down and I have lists yeah. so that I can do these things passively in the room I might take out um, a Sphero and just say hey kids let's paint mm -hmm. um, I might uh, have a robotics out I might you know I might just grab a group of kids and just do something fun yeah um, and we take it on the bookmobile too so you never yeah. know what we might do yeah cool um, Cynthia who do you collaborate with you know it's like we always hear this like teachers work alone but I know that all of this can't happen just by yourself so how are you putting this all together? Yep, that's right. So uh, the Engineering Club is a group of students ranging from 15 to 20 in any given year. There are a couple other STEM-based clubs in the school, but really um, the exciting part is we live in a city that has a College of Engineering. Um, so we work with the Diversity Affairs Office at that College of Engineering. And then there are local ch chapters of several um, different organizations. Uh, one is called NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers. There's a Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. There's the Society of Women Engineers, Engineers Without Borders. All of those organizations have strong chapters at our local university. So we're able to uh, collaborate with them. And even um, lately, the over the past uh, 10, 12 years, we've had such wonderful results that it's often our own alumni who are uh, members and officers of those organizations and who are very happy to come back and try to reproduce or build on the experiences that they had when they were students. And now they're creating those experiences again for uh, their younger peers. Um, what, so what that's, kind of things do you have to do? When they, when they come in, what are the kind of things they do in your school? and what do you hope and right so um, so for example the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers already has something called um, a science night um, that's a that's a national initiative and the local chapters can get funding to uh, pay for translation services to pay for uh, materials for activities and uh, maybe uh, funds to uh, hire a venue. Um, so there are all these other groups that have access to either funds or just expertise. Um, our, our former students love to come back and say, hey, you know, when Miss Chin taught this, <laughs> it really worked in my college classes. Or when, when I went to college, I didn't know what I was going to do, but then I got started a, a nuclear engineering and they showed me a reactor and I, I went crazy. Now I want to do this and I want to do that. And they love giving advice to someone that's, you know, maybe two, three years coming up behind them. Um, so the college kids are great. If you have a, a university or a technical college, technical colleges are also wonderful resources. They often have clubs that are looking for things to do. Um, and then outside of a, a post-secondary setting, 
Um, our city has conservation groups, astronomy clubs, maker spaces, computer programming firms, solar energy consultants. There's all these local entities that, um, as Tina was saying, if you just start reading the paper, you and once you're into this, you see things everywhere. Every time you read the newspaper, you only have to get about two lines in before that's somebody I want to talk to. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's, you just start to see it everywhere and you just need to just make your cold calls and then start developing those connections once you've, right. once you've made the initial contact. So what do you say? How do you recruit them? What do you say to them when you make those cold calls or when you call up an old, you know, what, what's the, you know, what's the benefit to them? Right. Well, um, I'll tell you the way I don't, this is maybe a little bit cynical, but <laughs> the way, the way the um, funding structure works at our state universities, they um, are under some, or they have incentive to, Pardon me, we've got a PA announcement here. <laughs> Sorry. She really works in a school. <laughs> yeah. So f folks in the university environment have a lot of incentive to explain to the public what it is they do. In fact, many of them, if they have any federal funding, part of their funding says you must use 1% or whatever the number is to do public outreach. They explain what you're doing. So they're actually looking for places to come and interact with the public. So that's a good selling point. The other one is um, you just say, hey, I read in the newspaper, you're working on this really interesting problem in our community. Um, our students probably don't even know that this problem is being attacked from an engineering standpoint. They might think just politicians do it or Maybe it just comes from the sky. Who knows what they think? They don't realize there are people actually thinking about these things, trying different approaches, and so forth. Um, and you know, good good things are coming. New things are coming. Improvements are coming. For example, we had major flooding in our city two years ago that really, um, you know, uh, really put things at a standstill in our whole city for a few days, and. The city engineers are working on that now. They're trying to change things. So, you know, local um, current events, you know, recent past, all those things, you just say, hey, can you come talk to kids about how it's done? And in particular, because I am not a trained engineer, I can't do it the way you would do it. I can't tell, I can tell you what I see in books, I can say what I see in the newspaper, but I'm not someone who boots on the ground knows what engineers are doing. And you are, so please come and talk to our students and tell them how you got interested in what you do and why you're passionate about what you do. And usually that kind of pitch really um, appeals to folks if they can, you know, get the time off or, you know, even, you know, volunteer some of their time. They usually see that, hey, you know, it was someone talking to me as a young person that got me started. I would like to pay that forward to the next generation. It's not that hard of a sell. It's more, the problem is just do they have time to do it? Right. But it's not, it's not like they don't want to do it. Yeah. Right. Um, same question, Tina. How do you uh, recruit volunteers for your programs? Passion. Um, you kind of listen to every single person you meet and you try and zero in on what their passions are because every person you meet is an opportunity to get them involved. And you also have no borders or boundaries with age groups. Um, don't forget the seniors in all of the uh, senior centers. Their newspapers are fantastic. There are some amazingly talented um, adult seniors out there. There's programs like Seniors Reading to Seniors um, and just trying to break down some of those stereotypes about the elderly, the aged, the amazing retired engineers. <laughs> um, so we, we do things like, we talk to our friends of the library groups, we go to the board members, we will go to teachers, we've had STEM award winner teach, teachers come in and give programs, we've had parents, um, 
do all sorts of different programs for us. Um, we put them through volunteer checklists, kind of. Again, there's that pilot's checklist, but you have to do some volunteer background looking into, you know, and are they comfortable doing certain things and what are their qualifications? So we do take a little bit of interest in that and try to um, encourage lots of ages. I, I completely agree with Cynthia though. Um, several years ago when I started this, I knew, I was relatively new to town, um, didn't know anyone and um, just started cold calling mm -hmm. and begging for assistance and help and volunteerism. Yeah. And that's when I learned that many businesses have written into their business plan, their strategic planning, that educational aspect. They're there to assist you um, right. and, and have educational programs. Um, so I had um, the electrical, our group, it's called the DMEA, uh, the Electrical Association help us with um, solar ovens. And then of course, getting the boxes donated by the pizza place doesn't hurt because that gives them business going, well, now I'm hungry for a pizza. So um, a lot of places just want to volunteer. Our CSU, uh, Colorado State University has a Tri-River Extension. They have all kinds of kits that we can borrow, just like the right. teachers um, borrow back and forth with us here at the library okay. too. So they might loan us the robotics or another one of our branches might have something I want and we can loan back and forth. Yeah, and the bringing, sometimes we'll even exchange our bookmobile. You know, if they'll come speak to us, they say, well, will you bring the bookmobile out then? And so we do an exchange then, there. Then you got books to go along then with you got that books activity. To support the activity, yeah. It's really successful and fun. And what do you both say to, so there's there's educators on this, on this webinar, there's librarians on this webinar, and then there's volunteers on this, on this um, uh, webinar and not all of them their phone isn't ringing like mine <laughs> so what do you say to them about how if they want to reach out to their local library or they want to reach out to their local school um what do they say how did how do they make that reverse cold call what would what would you want to hear from a potential volunteer calling you i want to hear some courage you know i i'd like to hear courage in their not being afraid that either they're too old or they're unable or nobody's going to be interested or what do they have to offer. I'd like them to step through those doors and come and have a conversation with us that shows, yeah, we're still a viable person here and we have a passion that we want to share and a talent we want to share um, because all ages respond to that. I, I, for us, it's, you know, having them here like right now after school and having mm -hmm. 50 kids running around, how, do they have the patience to deal with children <laughs> right. running? It's kind of getting a bit of a body language and, and testing them out in a situation. <laughs> yeah. We have to know that they can handle all these kids that might be raising their hand, talking out of order, wanting to touch whatever they brought. Mm -hmm. um, do they have the patience for that is one thing we have to look at. And then are they, they knowledgeable? Um, and we'll, we'll get word of mouth. We'll check things out to make sure that they're appropriate mm -hmm. um, and, and suitable for our programs. So we do that too. Or maybe we can find a different place for them in the program. Maybe they're not a speaker, but- Maybe not children's, maybe they're adults. Right. Um, there's a, usually you can always find some skill that they can bring to the table and be included, usually, mm -hmm. I would say. Right, and our, our school district is fairly welcoming to parents and other community volunteers. I think, um, you know, someone who has a sort of a grand plan, some, you know, major technological innovation that they're just, you know, dying to show off to the public, they certainly could contact uh, a curriculum uh, person at, at the school district level. And, and make sure that their name and information is distributed. But actually talking to your local school works pretty well. If you just call the office and say, I'm a STEM professional, I, I'm really interested in seeing all kinds of children have opportunities with STEM and to see themselves as, as future uh, STEM students and workers. Um, there's, there's usually some teacher that's kind of just out there just waiting to do the next new thing. And so if you contact a local school and say, hey, I'm here too, is there someone who's looking for an activity to do 
or would like to collaborate on an activity. If, if the volunteer is someone from an agency that sort of has a ready-made activity that's ready to go, teachers love to hear that. Um, but it's, it's usually possible to connect with someone who's willing to invite you into their classroom. And I've had people come to the classroom and it wasn't great, but we kind of work on it and we figure out, hey, next time let's do it this way. Um, and just, just get started. Um, another big thing that, um, that has worked in terms of introducing people to the building is, and actually our engineering club was started by college students volunteering to tutor. They said, hey, we just like to be math or science tutors. And then once they get to know the kids, all of a sudden they're, wait, I'd really like to introduce this group of students to what I do on my job. Or the college uh, university students who are coming and tutoring say, hey, we'd like to start a junior chapter of our National Society of Black Engineers at your school. That's actually how we got started. Um, and so that's an easy way to just sort of learn your way up around the school environment. Just you know, offer to do a little tutoring on the side because every school is open to volunteer tutors. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and teachers and administrators know exactly what that is. There are always protocols in place for that. So it's an easy way to get started in a relationship with a school. And once that's begun, and you start to talk about your own particular areas of expertise and your passions, as was mentioned before, you, there are ways to definitely start working those in and building on those contacts. Mm -hmm. That's, That's great, great advice. advice. Great advice. We actually have um, two questions from Kelly now. Um, she asked specifically about that, uh, Cynthia. Um, do you prefer that volunteers come to your organization with an activity and plan in mind, or come and say, I'm here to do anything you want when do you need me? Where do you need me? Um, so for both the, for all three of the panelists, um, do you have a preference um, for volunteers when they approach you like that? Um, what we tend to do with our volunteers, if someone comes to us and says, hey, I have a background or I've retired from a profession in a particular field and I enjoy doing these particular activities, we'll say, you know, that's great. We can probably work you in, but why don't we first connect you with a teacher at the appropriate grade level and, and talk about what are they doing in their classrooms right now. Is there a very, is there a logical place where that activity connects with something that's happening now? Or, you know, maybe it's just, hey, we need a break from the usual routine. Let's just do something really different. But just to give the teacher an opportunity to think about how it might fit um, is always helpful. Um, and I work in a high school, so there are many different versions of science and math that happen in our building. And sometimes it's easier to target an activity toward a particular grade level or a particular class where it's it's got a closer relationship to the curriculum. So I would not hesitate to go in, uh, you know, um, advertising your favorite activity. Um, but, you know, expect to do a little bit of collaborating, a little bit of tweaking just because also, unless you have a professional educator background, you probably wanna take advantage of what tweaks the teacher can offer you in terms of what's going to make the activity work better for a particular age group. Right, right. we agree, yeah. pretty much the same thing. They can come to us with um, ideas, activities, what they um, are skilled at, but they also have to, um, be able to fit in and collaborate with what we know works mm -hmm. for the library, our patrons, our programs. Right. Um, so yeah, we we can go either way with it the same as Cynthia. Yeah. Not, yeah, look, it's like when you bring those technical professionals with those educators together, magic happens, right? Because everyone mm -hmm. has their skill set and yeah. it's kind of just open communication and, and talking about what you have to offer, what they're looking for, what they're doing and uh, just kind of seeing where, seeing where you can fit in. So don't be afraid, volunteers, to get out there and call. I think that's, that's right. Way. So um, we're coming down to the end of our conversation, so I just wanted to hear from each of you, what's an easy thing our help help people might be able to do this Engineers Week or Girl Day? Something that they could implement, you know, pretty quickly or, or just something that they could, that they could, uh, they could take up. 
I would say um, if if depends on your budget, one of the simplest things we did um, actually was at the end of last summer when the theme was space. Mm -hmm. We collected a ton of recyclable materials and just cleared part of the room and let the kids build a space station. Um, they gave them duct tape, recycled materials, and just said, here, yeah. little bits and parts and uh -huh. knobs and whatever they wanted yeah. and just said, here, build yeah. something for us. We, we watched, made sure it was structurally sound, not gonna collapse on a toddler or anything because they just wanna crawl through it. Um, but that's one of the simplest things. Um, we can have book displays, we can have simple crafts out, we could have Play-Doh and popsicle sticks and like Cynthia said, toothpicks and marshmallows. It just kind of depends on your budget, how far up you want to go with this, but. Right. Yeah. Do Cynthia, you, what would you say to a teacher out there who's thinking about starting something? Well, I think there are, it, it may be um, coming up to, to feature some of the resources that are out there in terms of finding an easy activity. Maybe you just do one thing in your own classroom and don't worry about spreading it, but it's kind of fun if you can build a little bit of enthusiasm with just your students to have them become sort of the missionaries and maybe they hang up some posters around the school. Maybe they take a really easy paperclip and string activity to another class and show it to some, somebody. Um, maybe you have a high school students visit a middle school and do something with them. Um, those are pretty simple. I think also awareness is pretty big. Um, I, I don't even remember how I became aware that there was such a thing as, as National Engineers Week, but I do a really, I try to do a really good job of making sure that my community knows about it every week. So I'll use the, the downloadable resources, the press materials. I get that out to the community papers. I put it out to websites in the community and just say hey you know there is such a thing as engineers week there are some things that you can do with your children um you know real simple activities here and some real interesting questions you can ask your um child as they do the activities that kind of push them toward an engineering mindset so i think you know in addition to doing things yourself just kind of spreading the word that this thing happens every year and hopefully you'll find more people that get excited about it and want to do things and maybe they'll come looking for you. Great. Um, uh, just this our wrap, final question. What's your favorite discovery resource? Um, you know, which, what's, what's your go-to and what do you like? Is there an activity you know from our website that you really like or? An actual activity? No, I, I do like your activities page though, that tab. Um, that is fantastic. Any, any website that has something like that that you can narrow it down by time, uh, ac how much time it takes, what your skill level is, what your age is, that's going to be helpful to anyone, I think. Cynthia, any, yep. any yep, so I mentioned the, um, the artwork and logos that are available for public distribution. Um, the bookmarks, I really like those. So the bookmarks are in English and Spanish. And each year there's a new set created that features three simple, easy to do at home activities and some good questions that a parent or a mentor can ask a child about what they're learning, what they're trying to accomplish as they do the activity. So those are real fun. Uh, we hand those out at our events. I might have a group of high school students like cruise through the high school and just hand them out at random. Um, to build awareness, uh, things like that. The posters are, are are kind of fun to talk about as well. So those are the the real um, quick quick and easy things that, that we use quite a bit, as well as the activity pages that was mentioned. We definitely search that for activities. Well, thank you both. This was a fabulous conversation, um, and just love to hear what you all have. Um, have been doing and Jake are there any questions from any other questions from the from our uh, viewers or our listeners uh, we've got a couple couple questions um, Kelly asks um, about Tina's um, your, your very impressive notebook that you um, showed oh. us briefly. <laughs> you digitize those idea that ideas list and have it share are you shareable on a Google Drive or some other kind of document like that 
Um, and I so have you may be available to folks. I have not. Um, I could certainly work on that. I didn't know anyone else would be interested in my ratty old notebook. But, <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I could certainly put something out there. If anyone wants to email me, I could copy it out. Can I have a copy too? <laughs> Great. Um, we also have a question um, from Bianca for Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, you mentioned the bookmarks, uh, but, but uh, Bianca also asked, um, where do you go for resources in Spanish um, when you had to focus on Hispanic and Latino kids and parents? So I would, um, you may not have a local chapter, but they do have, there are regional organizations. The a group is called the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. It's abbreviated SHPE. And they can usually find you somebody in the vicinity. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, Discovery is the main website where I've seen materials in Spanish, but I'm trying to think if some of the other websites I do, I use have them, I might have to like go away and research and come back to that question. So um, I don't know if our emails are out there or, um, or what, but uh, the other option is if you have school resources, where maybe you have a bilingual resource specialist in the school who is willing to do a little bit of translation on an activity that could work. Um, or there may be community organizations that have other contacts that you may not be aware of. So if there's a, a Spanish language resource type organization, an immigrant rights organization, often they have also educational programs. Um, community literacy organizations that teach English as a second language will often be networked with groups that could either help with translation or that could connect you with materials in a second language. And just as Discover E, we do have a lot of our activities are translated into Spanish, Arabic, French, Russian. <laughs> And another one, uh, five different translations, uh, five different languages that we translate into. So um, that's a good, and you can just uh, toggle on our activities page to see which ones are translated. One, any more, uh, any other questions, Jake? Yep, uh, the answer to this might also be the Discovery E activity page, but uh, Amy asks, what are some activities that you may plan or recommend for preschool students? Mm -hmm. That, um, we did um, squishy circuits. Um, I made the conductive Play-Doh for a week to have enough for 45 kids. <laughs> it's exhausting, um, <laughs> but fairly cheap. Uh, and that was for the Stream Junior and those kids ranged from two and a half yeah. up to seven or eight in their families. So um, it's conductive Play-Doh, which is basically a lot of salty Play-Doh. And then there was a non-conductive one um, both quite simple to make and you can find the um, recipes online and then you just teach them simple circuits with the LED lights um, and a battery. Uh, they had a great time. They made made a face or lit, lit up the eyes or things like that. Um, so what else? Legos are very simple oh, with tiny people. Um, we have, lots of, uh, we have we have preschool activities and uh, early K activities, and I would say the other place to look is PBS. Mm, um, yes. Okay. Has, uh, if you go to pbskids.org, they have a ton of preschool activities from art mm -hmm. from um, Peep in the Big Wide World and, uh, right. and Curious George and, and all of that. We have some of their activities on our website. They've been uh, generous enough to share them with us. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Right. And, and we've also found that activities often the design and build aspect of try to accomplish a certain goal and then see how well you did. That scales very easily from one age group to another. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, something that could be really technical for a high school kid. The, the idea of building what's the tallest thing you can do with a spaghetti noodle. I mean, that's pretty accessible to, to young kids as well. Yep. So, you know, you'll get really different products from them, but, <laughs> but, they're, but they're still engaging in the task and yeah. 
And I think the idea behind the, the engineering piece is there's a goal, let's see what happens, and then could you do it better? And those questions work at any age level. So even the simplest activity, even activities that you already do, you could just put an engineering spin on it. Yeah. Play a game and then say, could you make this game better? And all of a sudden it's an engineering question. So that's another thought. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, we have two other quick questions. Uh, we're getting tight on time, but um, just real quick. Um, Melinda asks, I have always offered some classes labeled for girls, um, but are you finding that this is being considered um, discouraging or exclusive? Would you recommend um, referring to, to courses or to activities uh, that way or not? We had that issue last year when um, we did that for the first time for introducing a, a girl to engineering and we had people call up and say, but I'm transgender, I'm binary, am I still invited? We invite everyone, we're just encouraging girls in particular or anyone who doesn't feel that they can um, proceed in a STEM field uh, or engineering, whatever that field is. We're encouraging everyone, uh, but all, everyone was included, even boys. Um, I, what we did though is particularly in the program at the beginning, I asked them who um, developed certain products, things like Kevlar vests or things. And there were obviously, it was must have been a man because men wear them. Um, and they were always shocked at women developing these things that mainly men might use. So um, we do try to to shock them a little bit and encourage them to encourage maybe their sister or their friends in other ways. But yeah, we we did have that we happen. we did have that happen a little bit. Yeah, we try to use the word family most of the time with our events, um, and then just leave it that seems to be a more inclusive term. We have had, as, as was mentioned, some pushback to using gender specific language. Um, the other thing I would say related to that is that many of the things that research has found that in terms of how we talk about engineering and what appeals to women, at least as women are socialized in, in the United States, often those are the same things that appeal to um, immigrant populations, it's just different ways of thinking about what engineering is for. It's not always with the strongest, the fastest, the hardest. It could be about what helps people the most. And all, just different language about what the goal of engineering is that uh, can be more inclusive, not only across gender, across the gender spectrum, but across um, all kinds of cultural um, spectra as well. Do we have time for one last question? Sure. Um, so Karen is the volunteer lead at um, the engineering firm where she works. Um, and she says they're working on visiting a local school and leading an engineering activity um, that they got from the Discovery website. She asks, what's a good engineer to student ratio um, so that they can plan accordingly for their, for their um, in-class work? Uh, she doesn't want her um, engineers to feel like they're getting thrown to the wolves. Do you have an age group mention? Um, she didn't mention. Um, oh, intermediate. The intermediate school. Middle school, I think. The younger you are, the more you people you need. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so for middle school students, we would often put the, the students themselves in groups of five or six to do the activity. And then I would maybe have one high school student for each two groups. So you have to ask maybe, are there teachers going to be present? Are there, is there potential to bring in maybe a high school student or, or someone else uh, to help out? It doesn't have to be someone who's totally knowledgeable about the activity. It can be someone who is, is learning right along with the kids. Um, but you probably want to have a few extra bodies in the room, as mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both, uh, all three of you, for joining us today. Um, and uh, 
we were going to go into some of the resources that are available on Discovery, but our time is definitely up. So I would encourage uh, everyone out there to go to discovery.org. Look at the engineers we've paged. There's idea starters um, uh, for just how do you celebrate uh, engineers. Uh, easy things to do, like um, Cynthia was saying, post something on social media. Hey, it's engineers week. I'm celebrating this engineer. Or, uh, you know, donate uh, uh, bookmarks to your local school or your local library. Um, to all kinds of easy things. We have activities, we have training, uh, and uh, we just hope that you all will take a moment out of your very busy schedules like you already have today and help us celebrate uh, the amazing things that engineers are doing and engage the next generation of kids. And don't worry if you can't do it during Engineers Week. It's really a state of mind. It's really all year long. I know that right. Cynthia and Tina and Jill and Jake and I do this 365, um, and it's just Engineers Week and Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day are just an opportunity to say, hey, look at us, look at all the cool things we're doing. Um, Cynthia, Tina, Jill, any final thoughts you want to share? No, I, mean, I, hope people, I hope people will just give it a shot. Yeah, 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 just go ahead. Your budget's not a concern. Usually yeah. you'll, you'll be able to find things. Be brave. Yeah, be brave. Here we go. That's growth mindset. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Bye bye. 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 Thanks.